Welcome to Introduction to Honeybee Swarms. My name is Phil Serafinas and we're going to give you a little tutorial on honeybee swarms. This is by no means a comprehensive course in uh, swarming or swarm capture or swarm prevention. Uh, this is intended for the novice beekeeper who's just getting started in beekeeping and hopefully there's enough information in this uh, talk to get you pointed in the right direction. Um, one other comment, it's often been said, if you ask six beekeepers a question, you'll probably get seven different answers. And in swarming, there's certainly <laughs> uh, the case to be made for that as well. Uh, so with that said, let's begin. Swarm topics we're going to discuss. What is a swarm? A lot of you folks are new novice beekeepers. Um, Swarming is an awesome sight of nature to see if you ever get a chance to witness one in person. Uh, the videos don't do it justice. Um, and we're going to talk about what are the reasons for swarming. Uh, why do the bees want to swarm? I mean, you provided them a nice home. You've been taking care of them. You've been feeding them. And what do they do? They up and leave on you. Not a good thing. Um, we're going to talk about how to identify the swarming conditions in the hive. Now these are things that you as a new beekeeper have to be on the lookout for uh, while you're doing your inspections of your hives. Very important part. And then we have last swarm PCC. What I mean by that acronym is first we're going to try to prevent the swarm. If we can't prevent the swarm we're going to use techniques to try to control the swarm. If we can't control the swarm we're going to use uh, methods to capture the swarm. April 21st, uh, my first year of beekeeping. This is my first introduction to swarms. I was cutting the grass a Saturday afternoon about noontime and I look up in a tree and lo and behold, what do I see? There are my bees. I go, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Um, this is my reward for successfully overwintering the bees. They left. So I have gotten a panic, got on the phone with an experienced beekeeper and he gave me a procedure on how to capture the swarm. Um, so after I hung up with him, I got my sheet, got my ladder, got my clippers, got my box, and within uh, 20 minutes after that, we had the bees in the box. Um, so the good news is we at least saved the bees. What is a swarm? Well, there are three types of swarms. There are reproductive swarms, there's congestive swarms, and there's absconding swarms. Reproductive swarms are nature's way for a honeybee colony to reproduce itself. Uh, it means the colony feels that they're doing well enough that they can reproduce. If we didn't have reproductive swarms, we probably wouldn't have honeybees today. Congestive swarms are caused by backfilled brood nests. That's when uh, nectar and or pollen gets uh, backfilled into the queen's uh, brood laying uh, nest. Uh, this is something that you uh, should try to prevent, particularly as new beekeepers. Absconding swarms is uh, a completely different type of swarm. Uh, it means there's something wrong with the hive or the hive environment. One characteristic of an absconding swarm over the other two is when the bees do swarm, all the bees in the hive leave and they leave no swarm cells behind. Now it can be caused by either lack of forage, it could be caused something by a predator or uh, some, maybe some kind of uh, overload of mites or something like that within the hive that causes them to leave very difficult to determine once the bees are gone. Now if left unmanaged, a honeybee colony can swarm every year or every other year. And the key here is left unmanaged. As a new beekeeper, it is your job to manage the hive to prevent and or control swarms. Now most swarms are general in nature because they gorge themselves on honey prior to swarming. And they need this honey in their honey stomachs because when they reach their new final destination, they have to build out a lot of comb and they have to do it very, very fast and you'd be absolutely amazed on how fast they'll build out a whole uh, brood box of foundation in short order. Um, also, uh, swarms uh, usually occur during good weather days between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, I would say that 90 percent of them probably occur in this area and before somebody beats me up and says, oh I had one at 5 o'clock and that's true, you possibly could and I have as well. But I'm saying 90% of the uh, honeybee swarms will probably occur between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And it's all, usually always on good weather days. Swarms will usually cluster on an object that's close to the original uh, hive site. 
Uh, this could be a tree or a bush typically. It could even be on the grass. Um, it could be on a mailbox. It could be on a picnic table. It could be just about anything. Usually the uh, uh, initial cluster site could be anywhere from right outside the hive to maybe 20, 30 yards away. Kind of depends on the topography of your uh, apiary. Now swarms will remain on the initial site uh, for several hours up to a couple days while the scout bees decide on a new home. Uh, scout bees actually engage in a democratic process or debate on selecting a new home site. This has been well documented by Dr. Tom Seeley. He has a briefing on the web which I encourage everyone to uh, view and he also has a book Honeybee Democracy where he documents this. Now you can have multiple swarms from the same hive. This happened to me my very first year. Um, a uh, person left me a uh, totally unmanaged hive in my apiary and it did swarm multiple times. Now the swarm size can vary from 40 to 70 percent of the bees in the hive. The average prime swarm will contain the old queen in about 16,000 bees and that's approximately four and a half pounds of bees which is a nice size uh, package if you were to buy one. Now after swarms are smaller in size and they have virgin queens um, so if you do happen to catch a uh, after swarm, uh, you have to be patient. A lot of people think that they have one with no queen in it, which turns out it's a virgin queen. Whether she makes it back from her uh, mating flights, uh, that's another issue. So um, just be aware of that if you do catch an after swarm. Reasons for swarming. Why do the bees swarm? Well, in a congestive swarm, lack of room in the brood nest is one primary uh, culprit. Um, the bees will store nectar and pollen in the brood nest if they have insufficient open comb. Uh, this will restrict the queen's egg laying ability. Uh, not a good thing. So you want to make sure you have adequate uh, room in the brood nest for that queen to lay. And we'll talk about that coming up. Uh, in a highly populated colony, the queen substance is not properly distributed throughout the colony. Um, the queen does not necessarily have to have contact with every single bee in the hive. Um, that would be almost impossible with 50, 60,000 bees. Um, but she has, uh, the workers will distribute her pheromone throughout the hive, plus when she walks across the comb, she's also uh, distributing pheromone throughout the hive. Older failing queens, um, the queen is unable to create enough queen substance. I think it's 9 ODA is the one in particular. Uh, when that uh, starts to go down as the queen ages, uh, that will cause uh, swarm cells to be built out. Some species of bees are said to be more swarmy by nature than others. It is often said that Italians do not swarm as much and Carniolans and Russians do swarm, but my experience is they all swarm. Uh, Carniolans get a bad rap because uh, in the springtime when the nectar flow starts they build out extremely fast and as a consequence if you're not on top of them they're going to swarm on you. Um, too many idle nurse bees. Um, you need to get those uh, bees building new comb in the springtime. This is an opportune time to start uh, getting your new comb built out and it's also a good practice to rotate comb throughout the hive. In my case, I do a third of the comb every year. I rotate out. Uh, overcrowding. Um, coming out of winter, you'll probably have one hive stronger than the other. Um, it's a good idea to equalize them. You can take bees from the strong hive and put them on the weak hive uh, via a newspaper combine, which you can learn how to do later. Um, also, um, some people like to do nukes and splits, and that's another way to relieve crowding in a hive. Um, it's your choice on uh, which approach you take. Inadequate ventilation, not as big a concern as it used to be. Uh, most people use screen bottom boards today in this area, I believe. Um, so it does help ensure that you do get adequate ventilation. It's a good idea to keep the vegetation down in front of the hive so you have uh, good airflow through the hive. And also it helps to control the humidity as well, which is also very important. Uh, so those are the types of things you should be addressing as a new beekeeper. As a new beekeeper, you must be able to identify swarming conditions in your hive. Uh, when a colony prepares to swarm, the worker bees will begin 
withholding feeding from the queen to slim her down for her swarm flight. It's been said that she has to reduce her weight by approximately one-third in order to get down to her flying weight. Typically a queen that's in full egg laying mode is nice and plump and she is not able to fly very well at all. The uh, queen's egg laying drops uh, prior to the swarm. Um, if you, you will notice this in the hive if you see fewer and fewer eggs every time you do an inspection that means something's wrong either the queen's failing or you may have a pending swarm something that you should be on the lookout for. Uh, the bees will seem to treat the queen roughly prior to swarm. As I said before they have to slim her down and uh, by giving her a little bit of exercise chasing her around the hive uh, that'll get her down to her flying weight sooner. Um, the queen will lay eggs in queen cups along the bottoms of the combs. Uh, this is a key thing to look out for and we're going to give you a picture of this in the upcoming uh, slide there. Uh, it's a kind of a thing that you ought to be on the lookout for uh, are the swarm cells uh, once they become active. Uh, prior to the swarm the bee foraging rate will be reduced. Um, you may see a, a lot of bees uh, lollygagging around the hive and you can't figure out why. It may be that you have a pending swarm. So it's another thing to consider. You need to look for swarm cells along the bottoms of your frames. I'm going to show you how to do that in what we call a tilt check and you should be doing it throughout the uh, uh, spring nectar flow season in order to check for swarm cells. Uh, swarm cells are usually numerous and they occur in multiple frames so they're not confined to a single frame. Most of the swarms occur in the early spring in our area but swarms can occur anytime up to September and I may even push that to October uh, with some of the warm weather we've been having. Uh, most of your uh, swarms will be in the early season during the nectar flow. The swarms that I have seen in uh, July and August and September are usually done by overfeeding uh, by new beekeepers causing a congestive swarm. Uh, you need to know the difference between a queen cup and a queen cell. And I define a queen cup as one with no eggs. And a queen cell is one that has eggs or larvae. Now you can tear down a queen cup and it's to no avail because the bees will just build it out again the next day. Swarm cells are more likely on the bottom one-third of the frames and they're usually at the edge of the brood nest. Um, so they don't have to be exactly at the bottom of the uh, frame. They can also be up there a little bit but they're usually on the bottom of the brood nest. Now after the first swarm cell is capped the bees can swarm at any moment. So, uh, so if you have a, if you find a cap swarm cell in your hive, you got to take some proactive control techniques in order to uh, control that swarm. This is an example of a egg and a queen cup. Uh, as you can see, there is a little white vertical, smaller than a grain of rice, standing up inside this cup here. Uh, this is one frame that is removed from the hive. It is inverted. Um, for clarity so you can see the egg. Eggs are extremely small. Uh, you should get used to looking at these extremely small objects because you're going to be on the lookout for them when you do your hive inspections. Uh, at this point we would consider this uh, egg to be uh, or egg in a cup to be called a queen cell. So this is a defining point here. This particular uh, egg was probably laid within hours um, it's not even a day old because it's still in a vertical position. So um, this is a common thing that you need to be on the lookout for. Here is an example of an active queen cell. As you can see here, it's been the cell's been torn back a little bit uh, for the photograph. But you can see this C-shaped larvae laying on a bed of royal jelly. Um, this is um, an active queen cell. Uh, within five to six days this thing will be capped and at that point the bees will be able to swarm at any moment. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you need to be on the lookout for in your hives when you do your uh, inspections in the spring. Um, uh, and if you do see this you're going to have to get into uh, swarm control uh, techniques in order to uh, control your swarming. This is an example of a capped swarm cell 
uh, on the side of a frame. Um, the swarm cells typically look like a peanut pressed on the side of a frame as you can see. Uh, typically they occur at the edge of the brood nest and uh, you will find multiple cells generally 10 to 20. Um, the number varies uh, with hive to hive. Uh, you can also find them along the uh, wooden frame at the bottom on occasion as well. Um, those typically sometimes get crushed if there's not sufficient bee space. So this is what you need to look for. Swarm prevention techniques. Requeen annually. I prefer to requeen in August, early September, uh, typically after the mite treatments have been completed. Younger queens are less likely to swarm due to increased queen substance. And this gives you an advantage going into uh, the spring of the following year as far as swarming. Provide adequate ventilation and cluster space. Uh, screen bottom boards are typically used in our area. Uh, in the winter time uh, an upper entrance is always desirable as well. It helps reduce the humidity in the hive. Uh, cluster space. Some folks like to use the uh, slatted racks to provide additional cluster space for the bees. Um, but that's a individual choice and it's up to the beekeeper. Annual frame rotation. Uh, it's a good idea to add new foundation in the spring. Um, this is a great time to get uh, new comb built out for your hives. You can never have enough new comb. Uh, you remove your old brew comb and pollen plug combs and replace them uh, with fresh wax foundation. This helps to um, prevent diseases within the hive and it keeps those nurse bees busy building new wax which helps prevent swarming. Brood box reversal uh, usually before the dandelion bloom and when I say in our area don't when I say dandelion bloom I don't mean one or two dandelions in your lawn I mean a significant amount of dandelions uh, popping up in the lawn. Uh, you must be careful when you do this that you do not break up your brood nest especially if you're one of the folks that uh, like to use the medium hive bodies. This is an example of spring brood box reversal. Um, I show an example here with three medium boxes this is kind of a worst case example um, versus uh, using two deeps. Um, when you do your uh, spring inspections you have to Make sure you're not splitting the brood nest, uh, no matter whether you're using mediums or deeps, but mediums uh, would be more likely to uh, be split. Uh, what I mean by that is most of the bees will be residing in the upper box, uh, so if you have your brood area spanning two boxes, uh, you want to bring those over and put them on the bottom and then put empty comb above them. Um, that's the uh, typical way that it's been done. This is uh, an example of incorrect brood box reversal. Uh, this is exactly what you do not want to do. Uh, as you can see here, the brood nest is split between uh, the bottom box and the second box, and you have a big gap in between. Um, if you do this, uh, particularly in the spring, it could be detrimental to the hive because we can still get freezing temperatures uh, even in the early spring. Uh, so this is uh, exactly what you do not want to do. Swarm prevention techniques. Uh, you need to ensure that your brood nest does not become honey bound or pollen bound. Uh, you can use various open brood uh, nest techniques uh, by inserting uh, new comb into the brood nest. This ensures that the queen has adequate uh, space to uh, lay eggs. You could also do uh, splits or nukes in the springtime. It's a great way to increase your apiary, or you could have nukes to sell if you so desire. Uh, you should equalize your strong hives and your weak hives. If you have two hives, you can reverse the positions of the two hives um, to have uh, so that way the forager bees, once the hives are reversed in positions, the forager bees from the strong hive will uh, augment the weaker hive. Uh, you could also do a newspaper combine of uh, brood. You take uh, a box of brood from a very strong hive and you could add it to a weak hive via a newspaper combine, which you'll learn how to do later, um, to um, 
equalize the strengths of the hives. Uh, during the spring buildup, you need to keep the nurse bees busy, as I said before, building new comb. New comb is a very valuable beekeeper asset, and you can never have enough of it. Okay, as promised, here's an example of a honey uh, bound uh, brood frame. Um, as you can see from this example here, um, there is a semicircle of cap brood still on this frame. So this was a brood frame in this dark area here, but the bees have backfilled this with nectar at this point. Um, so we're going to call it honey in the brood nest. And as such, when the queen comes up here to lay, she's not going to have sufficient space to lay eggs. And this could be a cause uh, for a swarm. Swarm prevention techniques. Adding honey supers at the start of dandelion bloom. Highly recommended. Um, not only to catch the uh, potential nectar flow that's upcoming in our area, but it also helps to keep uh, honey and pollen out of the brood nest and that way the queen has uh, space to lay eggs. Uh, provide an upper entrance to the honey super. Uh, it can help relieve congestion in the brood nest. This can be accomplished with either emery shim, which is a three quarter inch shim that you would put uh, between the honey supers, um, or you could drill a three quarter inch hole in one of your honey supers as a upper entrance as well. In beekeeping, timing is everything. Um, I recommend that you do uh, checks on your hives on a weekly basis for swarm cells. Uh, once the queen cells are uh, capped, um, they, bees can swarm at any time. Um, you need to employ some kind of proactive uh, swarm control techniques at that point. Just cutting out the queen cells is risky business. Um, you can make use of these queen cells to make nukes for increase. Uh, when I mean increase, I mean establish a new hive uh, for you new beekeepers. Or you could uh, uh, give them away or sell the queen cells to other folks in your club if you desire. Clipping the wings uh, does not prevent swarming. Um, the queen will may try to fly, uh, but she may end up on the grass and she won't be able to get back to the hive. The bees may return to the hive and they may swarm with a virgin queen. Uh, so clipping the wings of a queen is not going to necessarily prevent your swarm. This is a tilt check for swarm cells. Basically what we would do um, during swarm season is every seven to eight days, depending on your schedule, um, take, uh, if you're in a two hive body arrangement, uh, take your upper hive body, tilt it 90 degrees, um, and smoke it uh, pretty good to look for swarm cells. Uh, this particular hive is not mine. It's one of the ladies that I mentor, and her hive had already swarmed at this point. Uh, so I didn't have to smoke it, but I found uh, a whole bunch of swarm cells. I think I cut 10 to 12 swarm cells out of this hive. Um, and also I found three virgin queens running around in the hive as well. Uh, so this is the kind of thing you want to try to prevent. So uh, some pe folks don't like to uh, mess with the bees during the nectar flow. And that's fine. That's your personal choice. But I guess because they're afraid they're going to lose some uh, nectar. But I guess my comment is if the bees swarm on you, you're going to lose a lot more nectar. So I prefer to go in and just do a quick check. It really doesn't take that long to do this. Um, so it's like an ounce of prevention. Swarm control techniques. Uh, a couple common methods are the DeMarie method and the Snellgrove method are uh, some uh, of the popular methods. Uh, probably the DeMarie is the most widely used one. Um, these techniques require additional um, equipment and or labor on your part. Um, you must be able to locate the queen uh, to utilize these techniques. So if you didn't get your queen marked, I recommend that your mentor or uh, I'll show you how to mark a queen uh, because it's much easier to find a mark queen in a hive with uh, 50 to 60,000 bees in it. Swarm control techniques. Uh, the Marie method uh, was published in the American Bee Journal way back in 1884. 
So after 100 years, it must have a pretty good track record because people are still using it today. Now, the demarine method uh, provides uh, for a good honey yield with or without an increase in colonies. And uh, of note here is that uh, this method provides a good honey yield. Not all uh, swarm control uh, techniques uh, provide for a good honey yield. That's probably one of the reasons why this method is popular. Uh, the object is to separate the queen from the uncapped brood and eggs. Uh, you will need a queen excluder and an additional hive body and some empty comb uh, to utilize this uh, method. Uh, now there has been many variations of this method uh, written up. Um, it is outlined in your textbook there for your uh, reading pleasure. It's been on YouTube, it's uh, all over the internet, and uh, so there are plenty of examples there. I have used it last year for the first time and it does work. I primarily use the Snellgrove method which is a, um, a little bit more complicated than this. This is a diagram of a basic DeMarie uh, setup um, shown here with uh, deep brood boxes. Uh, the bottom box you would arrange such that you would have the queen plus one to two frames of uh, cat brood and the rest would be empty comb, preferably comb. Uh, you would then add your queen excluder, then your honey super, and then you would take the rest of the uncapped brood, eggs, and nurse bees and uh, they would go in the top box. Uh, this can be done with or without increase. Uh, for further detail on how to uh, implement this method, you can go to this one link in the UK. They have some examples there or um, it's also written up in your book as well. Um. Which technique should I use? That's a question we get asked a lot and uh, there's no easy answer to this. Um, the reason being is uh, you got to decide whether you want colony increases or not increase. Do you want good honey flow or are you just interested in preventing swarming? Um, I list here some other swarm control techniques that are not as uh, common like pageant method, Horsley, and then uh, the Snellgrove which I use. Um, it's kind of up to you. You can do a shook swarm. There's all kind of different techniques, but uh, you have to uh, read them over and determine which one's the most appropriate for your operation. Um, now the Snellgrove method was developed way back in 1934. It uses a double screen board uh, with all these little doors in it. Uh, it does give a good honey crop and allows for new queen uh, to be raised uh, for colony increase or requeening later in the fall. Um, when I used it the very first time, uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised on um, how well it worked. Um, this method uh, requires manipulation of the doors every few days. Um, as a result of that, it's really not suitable for out yards. You're not going to want to drive 10 to 12 miles uh, just to flip a board or, or a door on a Snellgrove board. Other swarm prevention resources. Um, I can recommend uh, Swarming, It's Control and Prevention by Leonard E. Snellgrove. It's a, a very good book if you're interested in using the Snellgrove method. Um, the book is that I tried to find it on Amazon and Amazon only had collectors copies so I caution you uh, they are very expensive um, I did find that Barnes & Noble uh, has reprints of the book uh, brand new for $16 uh, when I purchased mine so that's one uh, source uh, Swarm Essentials uh, that one is in our library if you so desire to read it and I think it's in Wickwas Press as well. Um, Nectar Management, Walter Wright, um, he had some articles written up in the Bee Journals several years back and I don't recall which issues they were. That's, uh, uh, he has an interesting um, um, way of doing what he calls Nectar Management and Swarm Prevention. And uh, a good read, too, is uh, Honey Bee Democracy by Tom Seeley. 
Um, and Michael Bush website also has a lot of uh, uh, swarming resources on it as well. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information out there uh, for your uh, reading pleasure. You have to be prepared for swarms. Uh, typically swarm season here is end of March, beginning of April. You should get your swarm kits ready. Uh, I typically use a sheet on the ground. Um, I find that it's easier for the bees to walk on the sheet versus walking in the grass. Uh, bees fly very well, but they don't walk very well. Uh, also have uh, at least one old brew comb to entice the bees in the hive. Um, I also use a little bit of lemongrass oil to entice them to come in as well. And uh, get your clippers and your ladder and then you'll have everything ready. <clears throat> There's two examples here of uh, swarm captures, one on May 2nd, one on May 3rd. Uh, the unique thing about the one on May 2nd is, is from start to finish. It's from the time the bees left the hive, swirled around in the air, landed on a, a branch in a tree, and, and then I cut it and got them in the box. Uh, the unique thing about the one on the second is that uh, you can actually see the uh, Mark Queen walk inside the box. The one on May 3rd was a total surprise to me. The next day I caught another one. Um, but uh, every swarm is a little bit different. Uh, they always have a little bit different twist to it. So I've caught every swarms everything from ground level uh, up to 40 feet in a tree in a bucket truck. Um, so it's always a new experience. Okay, to summarize things, uh, basically your goal is to manage a strong hive and to prevent swarming uh, to maximize your honey production. There's kind of a fine line between maximizing your honey production and uh, triggering a swarm. You want to maximize the number of bees so you can collect, collect the maximum amount of nectar. Um, you need to employ uh, early spring management techniques um, in order to prevent swarms. Uh, timing is everything in beekeeping. Uh, regular checks are recommended for swarm cells at least during the uh, swarm season. And last but not least, you need to be prepared. <laughs>